Hello. In this mind map, we are going to look at important clinical pathologic correlations in thyroid diseases. So first of all, let's do a very quick recap of the anatomy and physiology. The thyroid gland weighs about 20 to 25 grams, um, and it's important to know the weight in endocrine organs especially, because you may have conditions like hypoplasia or hyperplasia, in which the weight may be abnormal. Next, we're going to take a quick look at the anatomy so that we can appreciate some of the symptoms uh, the patients may have if the thyroid gland is enlarged or if there's a tumor mass that infiltrates into adjacent organs. So posteriorly, we have the esophagus and of course, if there is any compression, uh, the patient may experience dysphagia. And then these two little uh, yellow dots here, these are the recurrent laryngeal nerves. So again, uh, compression or infiltration from the thyroid can give rise to hoarseness of voice. And finally, anteriorly, of course, we have the trachea. So um, any compression can give rise to stridor or difficulty breathing. The next thing that we're going to look at is the function of the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland is composed predominantly of follicular cells, which produce our thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. And these are very important in regulating basal metabolic rate. So many of the symptoms that come from abnormal function are related to basal metabolic rate. They are also important in regulating growth and maturation, especially um, development of the central nervous system. So babies that are born with low levels of thyroid hormones, they can actually experience both growth as well as mental retardation. And the combination of this is known as cretinism. The other cell type in the thyroid gland is a much smaller population of parafollicular C cells which produce calcitonin. And this contributes in part to calcium metabolism, but not as much as parathyroid hormone. Now we are going to focus on the main clinical presentations of thyroid disease. The thyroid gland, being an endocrine gland, has an added component to clinical presentation, which is that of functional abnormalities. And in addition to functional abnormalities, of course, the patients may also complain of an enlarged thyroid gland, uh, and this is known as a goiter. So let's start by looking at functional abnormalities first. And we can simply look at them in terms of too much function or too much hormone. So that's hyperthyroidism versus hypothyroidism. Now you notice here that I've written primary and secondary. Primary hyper or hypothyroidism refers to where the actual cause is in the thyroid gland itself. And as opposed to this, secondary hyper or hypothyroidism is when the cause originates above the thyroid gland and in the pituitary gland. Because the pituitary gland produces TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which then stimulates the thyroid follicular cells to produce thyroid hormones. So here we're going to focus on primary disease of the thyroid gland. And let's first take a look at hyperthyroidism. So we're going to look at the causes. One of the commonest causes of uh, endogenous hyperthyroidism is Graves' disease. This is an autoimmune condition. There are also other less common causes that is toxic multinodular goiter or toxic adenoma, which is a toxic neoplasm in the thyroid gland. These two are fairly rare and you can occasionally have nodules or neoplasms that uh, produce an excess of thyroid hormones giving rise to hyperthyroidism. Most of the time, multinodular goiter and thyroid follicular adenomas are euthyroid. And of course, we must also uh, remember the possibility of iatrogenic causes or patients taking some sort of hormonal supplements. So exogenous thyroid hormone administration can also give rise to a state of hyperthyroidism. Now let's look at some of the clinical manifestations, and this includes both symptoms as well as signs. So go back and think about metabolic rate again. So usually there is a state of increased metabolic rate in hyperthyroidism and this gives rise to tachycardia, increased appetite, uh, yet there is loss of weight. The patients may feel irritable or anxious. There may be a tremor as well. And the patients may also experience heat intolerance. Exophthalmos is a sign where there is forward protrusion of the eyeballs and this is specific to Graves' disease because it is due to an autoimmune mechanism 
This gives rise to inflammation, edema, and accumulation of extracellular material in the orbital tissues. So this pushes the eyeballs forward, giving rise to this appearance. Now, in terms of abnormal findings in the blood test, of course, we would expect the thyroid hormone levels to be increased. And because this is primary hyperthyroidism, the TSH will be reduced because there is negative feedback from this excess of hormones to the pituitary to reduce TSH production. Now, let's move on to hypothyroidism. And again, we'll start off with the commonest cause of endogenous hypothyroidism, and this is Hashimoto thyroiditis. This is also an autoimmune disease, like Graves' disease. And other causes would include congenital hypothyroidism, for example, uh, aplasia or hypoplasia of the thyroid gland. And again, very similar iatrogenic causes, for example, if there has been thyroid surgery or if there has been radioiodine ablation, destruction of the thyroid tissues, perhaps due to intractable Graves' disease. Clinically, you would think again of basal metabolic rate and think of everything that is opposite to hyperthyroidism. So bradycardia, decreased appetite, yet increasing weight. Um, patients may feel slow and lethargic and they may experience cold intolerance. Now, in terms of the blood tests, again, you would expect the opposite. So reduced levels of thyroid hormones and increased TSH because the pituitary gland is now stimulated to produce more TSH. So again, I want to stress that this is primary hyper and hypothyroidism. Now let's change track and have a look at causes of goiter or causes of enlarged thyroid gland. The first distinction that we want to make, and this is also a clinical distinction when we examine the patient, is that is this enlargement diffuse and symmetrical or is it a discrete enlargement where we can see a nodule in the thyroid gland or we can palpate a nodule? The differential diagnoses are quite different. So in diffuse enlargement, we would think of systemic conditions such as autoimmune diseases, so Graves' disease, Hashimoto thyroiditis, and other thyroiditis, for example, de Quervain or subacute granulomatous thyroiditis. And a simple hyperplasia, which is uh, the earliest stage of multinodular goiter, uh, can also cause a small diffuse goiter. So this is an example here of a diffuse goiter, and you can see that the thyroid gland is pretty enlarged. The lobes are quite symmetrically enlarged, and there is no real definite nodules or masses. The thyroid gland is also quite dark in its uh, cut section, and this is an example of Graves' disease, a classic cause of diffuse goiter. Now let's move on to look at nodules, and we are going to talk about non-neoplastic versus neoplastic nodules. So the non-neoplastic nodules uh, that can cause nodular enlargement would be multinodular goiter. Um, in fact, this is the commonest cause of a goiter or a thyroid nodule, for example, a dominant nodule in a multinodular goiter. Sometimes, even these conditions that usually cause diffuse enlargement, such as the Quervain or Hashimoto thyroiditis, this can cause asymmetrical enlargement of the thyroid gland, which may also present clinically as a nodule that the patient feels. Now, moving on to the neoplasms, Again, we want to split this into the most uh, clinically relevant division. So, of course, we're going to have benign neoplasms versus malignant neoplasms. And uh, the main benign neoplasms in the thyroid gland, there are really few, follicular adenoma and Hertel cell adenoma. So, this really gives rise to very well circumscribed rounded nodules, which are encapsulated, and you see that they are discrete and there is actually some uh, uninvolved thyroid parenchyma here. So this is an example of a follicular adenoma. It's very different from the diffuse enlargement that we saw here in Graves' disease. Now moving on to the malignancies, we are going to divide them into those that are of follicular cell origin and those that are of non-follicular cell origin. And here I just want to stress that I'm focusing on primary malignancies. You can also have uh, metastases going to the thyroid gland uh, rarely. 
So among the follicular cell origin tumors, we start off with the well-differentiated carcinomas, which include papillary thyroid carcinoma. This is the commonest malignancy in the thyroid gland and follicular and hertel cell carcinoma. The prognosis for these is excellent. And then, of course, there are poorly differentiated thyroid carcinomas. And this is sometimes also known as insular carcinoma because of the histologic appearance of islands of malignant cells. And then right at the end, the worst end of the spectrum is the undifferentiated or anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. This has a very poor prognosis. So within the thyroid, we have tumors that are of a very good, excellent prognosis all the way to very dismal prognosis. And lastly, we are just going to look at the tumors that are of non-follicular cell origin. And this includes medullary thyroid carcinoma. So these tumors may be sporadic or they may be associated with a background of men syndrome, multiple endocrine neoplasia or familial medullary thyroid carcinoma. And uh, the clinical clue is that these patients are usually younger and the tumors are multiple. And last but not least, primary lymphoma of the thyroid gland. And this may be associated with a history of Hashimoto thyroiditis. So one of the red flag signs in a patient with a known history of Hashimoto thyroiditis is recent progressive enlargement of the thyroid gland. One would always be concerned about thyroid lymphoma. So in summary, this uh, mind map just essentially brings up the commonest clinical presentations of thyroid disease in terms of functional abnormalities, too much, too little, and in terms of thyroid enlargement, which can be diffuse or it can be more discrete. And this includes non-neoplastic and neoplastic causes. And of course, you can see that the same conditions can cause both functional abnormalities as well as thyroid enlargement. Thank you.